We've been talking about cities, which are a passion of mine, and we've been talking about how to intervene, how to act within the cities. And what I'm going to say is that the museum is also an urban actor, which I don't think it's too original. And we've heard today already about talking about museums and how they can have a role in educating people, in creating something that is different. But what I want to do is precisely maybe just showing the zeitgeist and revealing that museums are trying to be different, not only by engaging audiences, no, not only because they're looking back in, uh, into their collections to show them in new ways, but they are also trying to come out of their role and intervene in the city in a different way. So that's why I was saying here as a title that the museum is an activator, it's an activist maybe, and potentially an agitator. And I think I should go back to the history of museums and understand what are museums and give you a very brief glimpse of how museums start. They start precisely with this passion of collecting. So they start with cabinets of curiosities, they start with people like Franz Ferdinand getting, amassing objects to show their status, their knowledge of the world, to share maybe that uh, sort of knowledge. And in fact, the first museums are created out of that accumulation of private collections, but soon they also become a forum for experimentation. So the Louvre, when it opens, has these salons to bring the painters, the artists together. And it sort of is, is a communion of what is going on in the city, but also showing things that are already in the collection of the museum. But there is an idea of formation of the collection by getting people together, getting the artists, getting the contributions, that I think is relevant and important here. And I now want to do a really big jump to the contemporary city, and to the way in which the city itself has many times become a museum. It's not only Vienna, it's also Las Vegas. By accumulating these references of architecture from all over the world, by showing itself as this desire to amalgamate, to show very different things, which I think is almost dangerously connected to the idea of consumption. The idea that we want these things, we want to possess these things, we want to buy things, and the museum in a way echoes and mirrors that kind of desire. So we want to know actually at this moment if museums are going that way, if they're looking for audiences, if they're trying to captivate and engage the people, are they playing the role they should be playing now or can they do something else? This is my question. I mean, I like Walter Benjamin and the way he thought about the cultural producer, normally the writer, and thought that the writer should reflect on the conditions of society, should be critical, should try and understand its, his own or her own relation to society. And that was the object of the cultural producer. So are museums doing that? Yes, we have heard already that museums are re-looking into their own history, re-looking into their collections, and they are trying to make something else. But there have also been tools of marketing, tools of creating cities. The Bilbao effect, as we architects and some others know it, is like this idea that the museum can come to a city and reactivate a city that was going down the drain economically because, you know, industry is no longer an important feature for that city. So, I'm trying to hint at the idea that maybe this idea of the museum is really not we, what we don't need anymore, although it has played an important part in being a catalyst, in attracting people back to museums. But then museums get really crowded, I can tell you. I work at MoMA, three million visitors a year, and it looks like a shopping center. And it really makes me afraid. Not because I don't want people to come and to enjoy the art, but because I think there's something wrong which I haven't yet tackled. But, of course, I also want to take advantage of the presence of that people 
to send some relevant message. And of course, these objects, like the Mona Lisa in the Louvre, they are incredible objects representing our culture. And people, of course, by taking the picture, by reproducing it in Instagram, of course, they are renovating that sense of a shared culture. But they are also creating another sort of museum, a museum of images with which the museum itself has to compete with. So it's all about consumption, and it's all about how do we get there. And this is an image I like very much, which is André Malraux, the famous uh, Ministry of Culture in France, and also someone who obviously thought a lot about culture, a humanist, looking or preparing the images for his museum. He thought of it as the Museum Without Walls, an imaginary museum. And he was already hinting in 1950-something at the idea that everything would become part of our museum. Every aspect of culture would become part of our museum. And yet, and because of that, and with all this competition going on for attention of the public, I asked myself if the museum should still be just about curating the objects, conserving the objects, and if it couldn't do something more, something else. And I think, again, talking about Zeitgeist, I think museums are precisely doing that. So I want to tell you briefly about a number of things that have been done in MoMA already before I came there, just with experience as a freelance curator, not really a museum person, and what is being done now that tries to challenge in a way, the comfort that an institution like MoMA has because it has three million visitors. When you have three million visitors, you're not competing for attention, but you may become too comfortable in not challenging yourself to do things differently. And so maybe uh, that tradition has obviously started when the museum started this young architects competition at MoMA PS1, which started as a simple idea an urban beach for those who cannot go to the beach. In a city like New York, a city that is tough, not everybody can go to the beach over summer. So these concerts, this music program with these architecture installations started to create that sort of place where people could find a place within the museum. And I call that the, mu the museum activating the city. The museum becoming part of the city, integrating people into their own space. And so you have this sort of atmosphere. And it was curious, like last week, there was a description of 15 years of uh, warm obsessions at MoMA PS1, and not one moment the, the writer was focusing on the music programs, talked about architecture. And that for me was really interesting, because of course I'm curating the architecture part. The thing you see there was a building, one of the competitions that won, and what was interesting for me in that building, the reason why we chose it, was that over its surface had these nanoparticles painting that would consume pollution. So this object being there it was not only the background to a party, it was also taking 300 cars of traffic every day from New York, just with these nanoparticles eating pollution. And this is part of a brief that we ask architects to consider, which is, OK, make this nice backdrop for a party, but also think about questions of sustainability in an out-of-the-box way. So of course, there were, curiously, in 2008, there was a turning point, I think, in which this conscience started to be uh, more evident, maybe because of the economical crisis. So, the idea of urban gardens started to also be part of those proposals. But besides these, besides this way of bringing some kind of message through architecture, maybe the ultimate goal of activating the city that one working from the position of a museum could uh, wish for would be the idea of curating the city itself. I don't think that is yet being done with architecture, it's difficult. This is an historical case in which Mies van der Rohe gathered a number of architects and they built a bit of the city in Stuttgart, the Weissenhof, in 
1927, just to make a statement about what modern architecture could be. And this was maybe the first moment of curating the city. And in my freelance activity, I actually had a lot of pleasure working in that sense, from the point of view of a festival, to just intervene in the city with proposals from young architects just being offered to a public, you know, really beautiful objects. But in a way, it was curated in city Why? Because it was using a, the, the idea of a program, a car park, as something that could be something more. Not just a response to a mere function, but actually architects thinking about how could they use this program, this urban program, to do more things, to do mixed programming, to think about buildings that are part of the city in new ways. But it was also a show. It was a show of young architects in the city. So it was, in a way, reflecting a need to go out of the idea of a museum within a room, within a certain space, and, and going beyond, going into the city, actually trying to gather people that would not go to the museum, would not be interested in this subject, and just, you know, grab them from the streets and make them engage with these ideas. So this leads, obviously, to the idea that the museum can be an activist can be, have that role of activating things in a, in a more political way. This is the first exhibition I did when I came to MoMA. The motivation was simple. When I was coming to New York the first times for the job, for the interviews and so on, there was the Occupy Wall Street movement going on in New York. And what I felt was strange was the fact that architects in the block sphere, if you want to call it that way, were asking themselves, how can we contribute? How can we do something to contribute to this movement? How can we express themselves, ourselves? And when I got into the museum, I thought, but wait a minute, polis equals politics. And architecture has always been political and is political because it's a statement. It's like we've heard bef uh, before today, it's a statement in public space. It's creating the public space. And therefore, architecture is political. And so the mission I gave myself was just to look into the collection and actually show that from the 60s on, actually, architects had been having a very political attitude. But as a curator, I was also dealing with an institution and tried to challenge the institution. So for instance, doing this newspaper that echoed that other newspaper that you saw on the wall, which was the Occupy Wall Street Journal, um, I decided to make this journal. Uh, it was the, the texts of the exhibition were meant to be taken home. Already this was a major disruption in MoMA because MoMA does not do brochures. <laughs> so just to organize this, I had to, like the first month, I had to go against the machine and the way it operated in a very perfect way, just because I felt people had to engage with the show by being able to make this newspaper themselves and bring it on. And then, if you go back to the 60s and you see architects proposing radical models of cities, what are they doing if not a very political statement about what cities are and how they need to be changed? Or you can even think that architects are also challenging the idea that the city is a mode of consumption. Or they can even be iconoclastic, which is something that you're not supposed to expect from architects. You know, the architect does not bite the end of his client. So how can you be iconoclastic? How can you go against the grain of what people are asking you to do? You are a service provider. You're not a cultural producer. Wrong. I think precisely you are a cultural producer and you may have a way of responding politically to any commission that gets given to you. So actually connecting to Vienna, you have Hans Olein, 1968, 1972, proclaiming everything is architecture, putting a aircraft career in the middle of the landscape and saying this is architecture because I said so. This is being iconoclastic, and it created things, ideas that are resonating until today. 
And of course, I was also interested in the idea that, you know, architects are again re-engaging into the social, into the participatory, like we said here. And so a section was dedicated to that. And actually, I had to make some acquisitions because MoMA has always been dedicated to the idea of collecting masterworks by recognized architects. And that's not participatory, social engaged architecture. So I had to go out and collect elements that I could show and integrate them in the collection. So by shaping the collection, suddenly the museum also starts to change and becoming more activist. So I showed works by artists that also are architects and do works that I won't describe too much here, but just again reaching for the idea that architects had to go back to the streets. They had to go out of the academic ivory tower and engage, re-engage with the city. So as to engage with communities like we've heard today by working with communities in workshop modes. This is the work of Ram Labor in Berlin. Again, out of the crisis, out of a need to change. This means for me an idea that architecture was echoing the idea of performance as in performance art. And so in another project that I was doing for the European Capital of Culture, maybe that could translate like it could in Vienna by occupying the fountains that had been the symbol of a certain kind of public space and make them again playful and usable by people, therefore totally subverting their political value. And actually, I passed by London coming here, and the V&A suddenly has this show on, Capitalism is Crisis, showing what people have been doing when they do the Occupy movements. So even the most relevant recognizable museums are trying to engage with this idea that activism out there is changing the way we act and react as a society. So this brings me to the idea that the museum is an agitator. And here I'll be very quick. I just want to say that in that respect, we have to look into the future. We have to check out what are the problems that are happening at this moment. And there has been a series in MoMA that did this with rising currents, climate alterations, with uh, economical crisis of foreclosures in the States. But when I got to do that exhibition, I thought, what is the major problem now? Maybe it is the fact, yes, that we have moved on to cities and that things are changing, not only because 50% are now living in cities, but because very soon, two thirds of those people are poor and will be poor. And therefore, inequality, growing inequality in our cities is actually the problem that we have to address. So this becomes an issue of how our cities are growing. And you know that growth is still a very be credo in our society. So using the examples of already existing activities, what I call act tactical urbanisms, people that are connecting the bottom up with top down, collecting important writers to think about that issue, contributing to that thinking, engaging teams that are local to different cities in the globe and others that are just researching urban phenomena, we can present visions for the future in which maybe cities can be different from what they will be if they are going to be what they are now in the way we are doing them. And the good news is that this show is coming to Vienna after New York as part of a biennial that will be announced next week, the Biennial for Change. So you'll be able to see it here in Vienna and also participate in this Tumblr which is where we ask the people to contribute examples of how things are changing. Thanks.